say a two-way street. I love Ratio. I love this. I love what they do. If you guys have been to Ratio events before, you know how awesome it is. If you haven't, you should be going to them all the time. Incredible organization. And it's really, really a pleasure um, to be able to be here. And uh, it's also a pleasure to see all your faces, people who come out here to see science, and they're both good things. Um, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey now, uh, and it's an interesting journey, uh, one that was not previewed completely. <laughs> so you're going to see some, some new, some music being made here that, well, there's no way to preview because it's going to be based on Mother Nature. And we never know what Mother Nature's going to do. So you guys are in for something that should be very, very interesting. Um, you can see my graphics are not nearly as good as what's done um, by Roxio, but I try, I'm a particle physicist, we have to show PowerPoint slides as part of the contract. <laughs> um, there's plenty of people who have been involved in the organization of bringing us over here. Uh, thank you, Rusty, for mentioning IPOG, the National Particle Physics Outreach Group. Actually, I've retired from being the chair. We only get to serve so many terms. And it's so nice, because I get to do what I want to do now. Um, I work on the Atlas experiment. We're also going to have physicists from the Atlas experiment. It's another experiment in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And they help to contribute to uh, this beautiful device that you're going to get to see here, called the Cosmic Piano. And um, there's many things. Also, um, uh, we came over here for a meeting, and it was sponsored also by Sophia Tech Park and uh, by a beautiful science organization, but mainly Lazio gets all of my love as well. And I should say, one of the most important things about these events, we'll do the event, it's going to be great, we're going to have a lot of fun, but if you want to stick around afterwards, and that's the most fun. I love to talk to everybody and, and to hear their stories as well. So let's get started. Let's see if I hit the right button. I did it. So we're going to have um, this story. Maybe I'll move over so most people can see this. Okay. Um, we're going to have a story of a balloon flight. Now I want to know, you guys are younger than I am, of course that's true of most of the world now. Um, but uh, does anybody recognize that at all? Is there anybody who would know this movie? Because I haven't found anybody yet who would remember this. Or well, one person actually did. This is a beautiful movie called The Red Balloon, La Ballon Rouge. It's a French movie from like 1956. It's, if you ever had a chance to see it, you should. It's, it's, there's, if I remember right, there's no sound, there's no words. And it's in the stories, it's magnificent. What we're going to do tonight has absolutely nothing to do with that. That was just a great image I saw. We're going to talk about this balloon. Uh, and this balloon is, is a special balloon. Uh, the guy inside it, uh, Victor Hess, uh, did an amazing experiment to help us to understand our universe a lot better. He went way up with this balloon. But let me tell you, give you some motivation uh, for why. It must be terrible. Back then, you didn't have an iPhone to take lots of pictures, and so that one picture that was taken of you your entire lifetime, your eyes are closed, it must be a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, those were the days. So I want to introduce you to uh, Bertha and Wilhelm Röntgen. Um, Wilhelm uh, discovered uh, x-rays. This was the first time we figured out that there's radiation that came from the inside of atoms, that came from the, the, the nucleus. And of course, the first thing you do when you discover something like radiation is you grab your wife and you zap her with it to see what happens. So here's where it's done. He could see her brain and the bones, and they said, we're out of something. This is something really cool. And we started exploring uh, radiation. What do you mean? This was, um, this was a big step for us. Um, what we do when we discover something, right, as you guys all know, is we measure them out of it. We measure things as much as we possibly can. So something, a new phenomena, and so we decide what is this radiation thing do? And it's a special kind. You guys always hear the word radiation. What bothers us is ionizing radiation. That's when it can knock an electron off, and that's what affects us. Most of the radiation around us, all the stuff that's giving us 3G and 4G and 5G, has no ionizing radiation. It's completely safe for us. But when you have ionizing radiation, that can change things. It might be what helped us to evolve, so don't be too harsh on it. Um, so we started to build devices that can measure. So when, when uh, ionizing radiation goes through this device, uh, it gives you some measurement and actually will move the dial up and you can see, ah, there's some ionizing radiation here. What things are ionizing? If you stick it close to uranium, you see it goes right up. It's surprising if you stick it close to a banana, you'll see it goes up a little bit because potassium radiates. 
not a lot, don't worry about it, you can eat bananas. Uh, but there, you can use these things. Right? You probably are more familiar with this thing, the Geiger counter, because you can sort of hear that. So we sample for that like this. You've heard that before? The, the, the sound sort of that. So what's interesting about this is that, of course, if you go close to something, that, that you hear a lot more clicks and it's a lot louder. But if you're away from it, it never goes off. It never turns off. We can turn it off. It's got a volume. Of, 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 but it, the guy on itself doesn't turn off. Uh, and so what they thought about this was, okay, this is interesting. Probably what that means is inside our planet, uh, there are things which cause ionized emissions. There's different wars which have radiation. And so uh, we can check this, though. Because physicists, we don't just accept that and get an idea. Then you got to measure it. So then what we did was say, okay, let's let's go up. Let's take this Geiger counter, it's actually with the, the electroscope, take it way up in the air, and then we will see that this goes down. And we, we can predict that and check this out. And so these guys here, uh, these were, I call them the high flyers. The first one, actually, I have a good friend who's a Swiss physicist. He made me put this guy in here because he did the first flight, Albert Gapo. Uh, the others uh, came from Austria, Victor Hess, and then later on, Werner Kohlhorster. Um, they uh, decided to do this experiment. And I'll show you some data. You guys are ready for plots? Discuss and show data. Oops. Oops. What's going on? What did I do? Oh, there it is. Um, so here's some plots, okay? The first flight by Gottfeld, 1909, he took it up and it, and it was weird. It, it, it kind of, you're expecting, this is altitude? Okay, I would have made the plot the other way, but anyway. This is altitude, and that's the amount of ionization you measure. And he saw like the first little bit there, it actually went up, and then it kind of went down, and then a little bit up, and he couldn't make head or tail of it, but he said, this is not right, it's not what we predicted. It should be just going down. So this guy, Victor Hess, said, okay, and this is, this is how we do science. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recalibrate, I'm gonna build a better measuring device that's more precise, and then he even said, and he sent it up in the flight, and he said, I'm even gonna go with it to make sure everything works, and he almost killed himself, and scientists do that as well. But he managed to go way up to, to 5,000 meters uh, in his flights, and everything was consistent with those clicks getting louder as he went up. There was radiation up above. And so, uh, and, and Victor Hess, in fact, he got a Nobel Prize for this after this guy, Polarster, confirmed it with a really nice measurement of way up. I think he, had, he got to have hydrogen in his room and way up. So, wow, why is it going up? What's going on there? Um, this is wrong, right? <laughs> it turns out that's never the answer. <laughs> it's never the answer. Physicists are wrong. That's <laughs> always the answer. And, uh, and that's good, actually. We like that. Um, we're strange people, but we like it when we prove, especially as experimental and psycho, when we prove the theorists to be wrong. Um, so, so the physics wasn't wrong. It's just that there was something up there that they didn't expect. And that was these things which we call cosmic rays. They shower down on us from up above. So I want to, I want to bring up on stage uh, a couple excellent physicists. They come from the ALICE experiment. Okay, we have a little competition between the experiments on the ALICE but ALICE is a beautiful, beautiful experiment that's designed uh, to measure the, strain, the strong interaction, which is very, very cool there. But these guys had some leftover parts and they built this device, we call the Cosmic Piano. So Arturo and David, why don't you come up? And Arturo is going to uh, explain, because he's the student professor. From Mexico, they came over here, and, uh, and Mexico just joined our organization, by the way, just joined iPod. Arturo is a representative from Mexico, and he's going to explain what this cosmic panel is. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's Sofia for my second time. It was uh, five years ago when I got uh, this uh, 
this um, a collaboration with Steve. And uh, as I, as Stephen mentioned, we are detecting cosmic rays in in a, in a real experiment in in a, in this uh, Alice experiment professionally. But because we want you to know that uh, every time, all uh, everywhere in the world, we are receiving, we are immersed in a in a cosmic shower. And that's because uh, we we are part of the universe. Uh, uh, what you see there are uh, many stars, many astrophysical objects that um, uh, light at night and also uh, during the day. But uh, at night we we see this light, and we used to to check. The, the behavior of, of that stars, this uh, astro astrophysical um, objects uh, through the um, electromagnetic radiation that they emit. But also, we, we know that those stars uh, also uh, produce some um, particles um, because of, of the um, uh, uh, nuclear reactions that occurs in deep in, inside in the in the stars, and they produce what we call cosmic rays. So those cosmic rays are electric, electric, electrically charged particles coming from very far away from from the, from our Earth planet. They hit the the Earth atmosphere and produce many many particles. And that, these particles, those particles, what we call secondary cosmic ray particles, is what we detect with these devices. If you turn on the, the, the sound that produce these devices, this detector, please. Uh, what you are hearing now is what happened with uh, when one of these uh, cosmic rays, yes, uh, uh, arrive to, to Earth, to, to the surface of, of our planet, and uh, crosses the, the atmosphere, the air, and hit these devices and produce what you are hearing right now. The, the cosmic rays are, are hitting uh, the, every, every place in the, in, in, the, in, in the surface of the Earth. They are hitting you, they are hitting us, they are hitting the, 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 the whole Sofia city, uh, Geneva, everywhere in the world, even in Mexico. <laughs> so, uh, what we used to, to do there at CERN is produce this type of, of, of detectors to professionally uh, make some physics with this, uh, uh, with this uh, physics information, but because we always have this uh, this uh, physical phenomena, we we like to, to do some uh, special thing uh, for you, for you to enjoy it. And what we have inside, uh, all uh, in one of, of these five detectors, are are uh, this uh, this thing, as, as I mentioned, and um, uh, Stephen uh, explaining explaining very good. We we have this cosmic uh, rays hitting the Earth atmosphere and um, being detected by us uh, with this type of detectors. So, uh, uh, this is a, a real simulation in, in the, in the uh, computer. Uh, when, when, you, when, when a cosmic ray hits the atmosphere, produce many, many particles, millions of particles, and some of them uh, hit these detectors, what, what we call the uh, cosmic ray detector, which in this case are uh, plastic insulators made of uh, organic material, and when uh, each one of those detectors are hit by these secondary particles, they produce a tiny light uh, and a spot of light, and we we take the light with this. Um, uh, fiber of the optic fiber 
we we detected with these uh, uh, optic sensors and converted in in some electronic uh, pulses and we produced light uh, this this uh, spot of light that, that you are uh, watching there and uh, this uh, sound spots sound pulses so uh, this is what what we have it, and on, on this real experiment we are uh, detecting right now cosmic rays with these devices so you are you are seeing a real physics experiment so um, this is uh, what we have uh, here in 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 other configuration this is the electronic device this is the the, the speaker that, that we have here and well, that's the cosmic piano and uh, uh, still we'll, we'll continue with this uh, physics introduction. Thank you very much. So, muchas gracias. Uh, I actually had, uh, I had the opportunity this past fall to go visit Mexico uh, Puebla, uh, where they have a beautiful detector on the very high up, 4,000 meters, 2,000 meters. Uh, it's designed to do exactly that, only it's a bit more complex. <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's, it's got very large tanks of water, but it also has explosive multipliers underneath it, and they do real physics with that to try to see what Mother Nature's up to. Uh, we've learned a tremendous amount. But now I want to pose a different question. Science is all great, but music is even better, right? So, so I would like to ask this question, and we're going to try to answer it here. Uh, Carolina Clonova is going to come up here, wonderful pianist, uh, and uh, from Sofia. And, and we're going to challenge her. So um, let me put her up there. By the way, she, she apologized for not having a professional photograph. Imagine that <laughs> we would just melt into a professional photograph of Caroline. Um, so she's, she studied um, uh, to be a pianist uh, in Varna, right, in Varna Academy of Music, and, uh, and is now studied to be a, a sound engineer. She knows sound, she can hear better than I can. And um, so uh, she's going to give us three bits of music for you. The first one will just show off that she's an incredible piano player. Just establish that. It's easy, and she'll do it. Uh, and then she's going to face the challenge of doing a duet with Mother Nature. So you guys have to see who you think is doing better, Mother Nature or Carolina. I don't know if we should have a vote afterwards or not. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have a third piece which she wrote for us. Wonderful. So, Carolina, please go ahead. <laughs>
Thank you, Carolina. I think I'm voting for her. <laughs> My voting agent didn't know when to stop. The rhythm was terrible. <laughs> she wasn't tuned, but that's about it. Okay. Well, that was really, really wonderful. Okay, now, now we have another challenge. This is a very interesting one. Um, I have some friends uh, in Barcelona uh, who are uh, cyborgs. Uh, and you might not have met a cyborg before, you're going to be a cyborg. But they do very interesting things, and, and I'm going to let them. Ty's going to explain uh, a lot of the things they do. Uh, I happened to be giving a presentation down there, and I met uh, Moon Ribas, who was someone who was connected to the planet, and she could feel the vibrations of an earthquake anywhere on the planet. And uh, because of the impact that she had put in there, she really felt attached, and it helped her to understand things. It was, it was a mix of science and art that I really, really appreciated. And so she took me in and introduced me to their whole community of cyborgs. Uh, and uh, I will let Kai uh, explain that a little bit more. But the question we're going to ask here uh, is, you know, can humans get even closer uh, to Mother Nature? And that's the idea behind this, is can they really feel, be a part of our universe, be connected, and use other senses than we're used to? Uh, and uh, and become part of what I would call the cosmic symphony. So I'm going to bring on Kai, and he's going to um, give us a demonstration, a really cool demonstration, that I'm sure that you're going to like, uh, that is based on pretty much the same technology, but what he has done to it is incredible. He's made music from the sound of Mother Nature. Maybe in more time, better timing. <laughs> so, Kai, why don't you come on up here? Hello, I'm Kai Landre. I'm a 23 year old cyborg artist from Barcelona. And uh, as Steven told you, uh, there's a cyber community in Barcelona which I got to meet when I was 17 years old. Um, one random night, I met Neil Harbison the first cyborg who's got an antenna implanted into his head in order to hear colors because he cannot see them because he's colorblind. And Moon Ribas, the girl Steven told you about, who's got two implants on her feet in order to feel the uh, seism seismic movements of our planet and dance to it. And uh, they basically introduced me into the movement of cyborg art. Uh, for those who don't know, cyborg art is a discipline of art which uh, aims to create uh, art pieces from the expansion or extension of our five senses. So basically how it works is each cyborg creates a new sense. In the case of Neil Harvison, it was the uh, sense of hearing color. In the case of Moon, it was the uh, seismic sense um, in order to create their artwork. In my case, I started creating the Cosmic Sense when I was 17 years old, uh, which basically allowed me to hear Cosmic Rays in real time into a musical scale I created, which I called the uh, Cosmic Scale. Um, <laughs> and so when I was 17, I started developing this new sense, which would allow me to create a new uh, artwork for myself. Um, I created an exosense, uh, which I call the cosmic sense, which receives cosmic rays from outer space and translates them into a musical note depending on how far the cosmic ray comes from our planet. So if a cosmic ray comes from far from our planet, um, it would sound on a low pitch tone, like, uh, and if it comes from closer to our planet, I would hear it in a higher pitch tone in a scale of 128 different tones. Um, when I first started hearing those musical notes, I thought, okay, what can I do out of it? So I started develop developing different artworks. I started making music out of the Cosmic Ray recordings <coughs> I got. Um, then I also connected my Cosmic Sense to an auditorium so everyone that was present, that was there, could hear how the space sounded like, how other space sounded like. And then I started developing this work-in-progress performance 
you'll be able to experience, which is called Mi One. Mi One is a sound design experimental audio performance, a lot of words, but it's easier than it might seem, uh, which aims to let the listener know or understand how a cosmic ray is created, how a cosmic ray travels through space, through magnetic fields, and how the cosmic rays crash into planets, particularly into Earth. Um, so it's mostly the life of a cosmic ray translated into music, okay? Uh, what I made is this abstract piece with a lot of different sound design sounds for CDJs, uh, so you could experience the life of a cosmic ray. So what you will hear tonight is a 20 to 30 minute sound design piece uh, where you'll experience in three parts, first of all, how a cosmic ray is created when a supernova explodes and a cosmic ray um, is uh, <laughs> accelerated until it goes far away into, into our universe. Second of all, a more ambient, melodic part of the performance where I try to represent how romantic it is for a cosmic ray to be traveling through magnetic fields um, in outer space. And third of all, you'll be able to hear a cosmic ray recording I did. Um, so yeah, that's what I called Mi One, the performance, and uh, I hope you like it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Actually be thought of as a highly advanced upper layer of the real world. In other words, physical reality is nothing but an illusion hologram of the information that flows to us through the wire.
admired might actually be thought of as a highly advanced upper layer of the real world. Physical reality is nothing but an illusion, a hologram of the information that flows to us through the wire. Cosmos, the cosmic sense cyborg. Thank you so much, Pat. Fantastic. Um, we're going to take a brief break here uh, and come back with the second half, which is going to talk about how we learned things from the cosmos in the ways, and we decided, hey, we can do that ourselves. And so I'm going to tell you a bit about accelerator uh, particle physics, uh, CERN, the LHC, everything you want to know. We'll start with quantum field theory. We'll have a math quiz afterwards. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, so that's going to that's going to end our first time. And I think that we have. Um, This is why Rothschild works so well. Google here gives me these things. <laughs> um, we're going to get started. We have to I promise we learned a little bit about particle physics that we're doing by using accelerators. I did want to mention, though, before I get started here, you might have heard some interesting music before the whole event started that was being piped in. It was um, orchestral music, there were some strings, and you piano. Know, that music was actually composed by a guy named Domenico Vicinante, who's a good friend of mine. And um, he actually sonified real data from the LHC, which the discovery of the Higgs boson. It was the distribution of data that told us that we found the Higgs boson. And he put bits of data from the different uh, components of our detectors and mapped them, and then he let it go. And it was really nice. So, uh, if you ever look him up, he a great guy. Uh, but let's get going. We're going to tell you a little bit about the story of particle physics, just to get started. Okay? Because uh, we need to know a little bit of our history. And it dates back uh, uh, some time ago. Um, this was one of our first conferences. We, we hold a lot of conferences. Um, this was an early, this was actually a very large uh, international collaboration at the time. Uh, and uh, it's the story of Og here. Og was running this, and she uh, was making a presentation, as we always do at these conferences. She was presenting uh, the uh, work of Zod, her student here. Uh, students do all of the work. I was going to say most of the work. Now, they do all of the work, and then we present it. Um, Zod, uh, he, was, uh, he was studying what happens when you smash things together. And he found some very basic rules which really still govern what we do today. That the harder you smash things together, the, the higher the energy is, the smaller you can probe into matter. And um, 
it was really reinforced but he basically made this discovery that stones were made up of smaller stones but that led the way towards what we do now and really it was groundbreaking research um, at the time so let's move move forward these are the the, the questions uh, that Zog in his paper you know, gave, gave, it wasn't really a paper it was a big stone um, uh, so we're, you know, the questions that he was trying to answer, the theory, we always have theorists ask us these questions, so where do we come from, uh, what are we made of, and, and what are the rules behind all of this, and, and what did she drop, I think all of it. it didn't break, it's okay, um, what are the rules behind all of this, um, so how do we find the answers to this? How do we measure these things? How do we how do we find the answers? Well, we had this device. This device is amazing. This device has worked wonders for hundreds of thousands of years. We used just this, and we understood a lot about our universe. But we're human beings, and we want to know a little bit more. But let me tell you, you know, before you just give up, oh, that's nothing. I'll show you what this thing does. Okay. This is my good friend, Eva. Um, she complained, I told her I'm gonna be showing your hair again. Eva is actually from Bulgaria. And she complained because she's been living in Geneva for so long. She said, my hair has made the trip to Sofia more than I have in the past five or six years. But I love her hair, it's very beautiful hair. Um, and many of you have beautiful hair, just notice that here. Um, <laughs> But what's, what I wanted you to notice is not just that it's beautiful, but that you, with your eye, can resolve the hair, the individual strands of hair. And we're talking about tens of microns, okay? There are tens of microns in resolution. The human eye can do that. That's pretty good. Uh, we can also look very far in the distance with just the eye. You don't need anything to be able to see this. That's Andromeda. That's a galaxy, and it's two and a half million light years away. It's actually getting closer. I don't know if you're worried about this, but, <laughs> but it is coming towards the Milky Way. We're going to actually pass through each other, um, but I, I wouldn't. I think it'll be after tonight. So just, um, we have had upgrades, though, because we wanted to see more, right? Just what our eyes can see. There was this guy, physicist there, uh, Galileo Galileo, yeah, Galilei. And he was there, you can see, talking to his friends. Well, not really all friends. Um, he was convincing them about the value of his new device that he invented, which used optics to be able to magnify it to look out into the distance. He was able to see uh, very interesting things here. Um, this is Jupiter. He saw that it wasn't just this bright dot, but you could see there was a planet there, which is already interesting. And then it had these things, moons, going around. It has many moons, actually, but these you can see. It. I mean, nowadays, your iPhone will almost get you to that. But that was amazing because, not just because, oh, you can see that, how cool, but then you started to think, wait a second. These things are orbiting around Jupiter. Maybe Jupiter is orbiting around the sun. Maybe we're orbiting around the sun, and that was bad news according to these guys, because they were pretty, these, are, these were theorists at the time, and they were pretty sure that their theory that everything revolved around us was true. Um, but, you know, uh, he didn't succeed in convincing them, but bit by bit, Mother Nature uh, convinced the next generations that he was right. Um, so, boom, a few years later, uh, we did this, and we took uh, this telescope and we stuck it up in space. The reason for that is just what we learned about these cosmic rays hitting our upper atmosphere and then causing showers. Uh, the upper atmosphere sort of gets in the way of our vision, what we can see. And so if you can get above that atmosphere and you can take uh, images from space, you can learn a whole lot about it. That is, this is the Hubble telescope. And more recently, you guys probably know about this. Uh, you guys seen this? James Webb Telescope, which is giving us incredible images, which show you uh, galaxies and stars that are very, very, very far from the, actually the beginning of our universe, right? Because the further something is away, the longer it takes uh, for the light to get to you, and so you're looking way back in time and out in space. And you can also see the sort of lensing uh, factor that comes in here because 
uh, light gets curved around massive bodies. So there's something really cool. We're learning a whole lot. We've learned much more about the formation of galaxies in our early universe. Um, looking in, here's Eva's hair again. That would be what Eva's hair looked like if you put it under a microscope. There are actually, I read that, that it's possible that Galileo helped in, the, in this invention as well. It's a similar idea. Uh, to make a, uh, a microscope and to look in. And this is something particle physicists are interested in. So we said, now how can we do better than that? Well, what we did was we, we put, instead of photons, instead of light, we started using electrons because we can make the electrons go to higher energy. And you got, as you guys all know, the higher the energy, uh, the smaller the wavelength and the more you can probe into that. That's what Zog was telling us in his thesis. Uh, so you can see here, this is not, by the way, this is not Eva, um, but you can see her hair up here sticking up very well with the electron microscope. And, um, and then we, we got some other ideas of how can we go to even higher energy. What we did was if you take um, and you accelerate to very high energies, charged particles, you can do that with magnets, uh, then you can look and see deeper inside of the matter. This is sort of what we're doing. Today, we're taking, we accelerate the particles, we pass them through each other, we cross the beams, we saw ghostbusters that can make all sorts of interesting things happen. Um, it does make interesting things happen. People, when, they, when they cross, you can see what comes out of the collisions. This is a typical uh, collision here. Uh, and yeah, I think that was a proton collision. It looks pretty clean though, could have been electrons, it doesn't matter. Um, but these are different particles that come out, and we measure the particles that come out from the collisions, and we learn about what interactions are allowed to happen on the inside. Particle physics is really, what drew me into it was the fact that we can't tell exactly what happened inside here, and we never will. This guy Heisenberg, not the one uh, in New Mexico, uh, the earlier Heisenberg uh, has, has taught us that we'll never be able to know. It's all probability. We just see what comes out and we calculate how many times we see different things, get probabilities, we build a theory from that. So we, we uh, do this, we make these uh, accelerators and detectors at collision points and we try to figure things out. So that's where we're at with that. So, so far, what have we learned? Well, we learned from our, from our telescopes that we live on a really nice blue planet, nice planet I've ever lived on, I don't know about you guys, but really nice planet, it's got everything we need for everybody on it to live really well, uh, that we don't allow that to happen is another issue, but uh, we can, it's, it's got everything we need, and um, it's part of this solar system, the solar system has a variety of different planets, and the asteroids, and the outside, all sorts of things flying around there, and um, uh, and that's just one star. There's one star that warms us, gives us our energy, really cool, really warm actually. Um, and that one star is one of 100 billion stars in our galaxy. See? That's a lot, it's a big number. Um, I would show you a picture of this. Well, here's a picture of it uh, without our star, and there's a picture of it with us. See the difference? See, see? You can't tell. That tells you something. Uh, how important are we? Um, but that, you think that's something? There's a hundred billion of those galaxies in our universe. Okay, so we really are insignificant, which is just so cool. <laughs> we can do whatever we want, right? We can do whatever we want. It's not going to matter. You're not going to notice missing from this. Okay, so have fun tonight. Right? <laughs> That's the that's moral of this. We also learned a bit, when you look out, you learn about time, right? The stars that are in the distance, they, they, um, they come from very far back in time. We learn by looking at different types of radiation, a bit about our history. We learned that there was a big bang. We can see this because there's, there's um, supernova and clusters of galaxies that are still moving away from us. Everything's moving away. Okay? And that tells you that they, they, they started uh, at one point. And I mean, all right, to be honest, we don't know exactly what happened in here, but it was energy that became matter. And that happens all the time. The Einstein guy, he wasn't so stupid. 
um, E becomes MC squared. And that happened here. And we had this big bang. Uh, there was rapid inflation. Everything grew very quickly. There was a lot of energy. Um, this here, is kind of interesting, is the um, uh, background, uh, microwave background radiation. That's what happened when uh, uh, electrons started going around protons or nucleons and started to, to that, that energy, that, that tells you the wavelength that they're at is when they started to come together. So when that started to happen, then once you have atoms, then they could cluster together, and eventually, because of gravity, they could get together and make clumps, which became stars, and stars could, could attract planets, they could form planets, and this happened all the way through time, and you got, you got uh, galaxies forming, you got them disappearing as well, the stars that came and went. I think we're on roughly a third generation star out here because they came and went, they came back. Um, and that all happened all through here. So it was 13.8 billion years ago, it's just before I finished my thesis. And, um, but what's interesting here, and I'm going to get back to this, this little curve here, because that's a really weird thing that we don't understand at all. So that's what we learned looking out. Looking in, again, we have Eva. Uh, and uh, and you can see that we learned from the microscope that these uh, hairs had structure to them. We learned that they had cells. And then bit by bit, we learned all these cells, they're made up of these different types of molecules. And those molecules are made up of different types of atoms. This is a very simple atom here where you can see um, that you have at the very Inside, there's a huge distance between here and there. If you took like a, a, a soccer ball and put it inside a huge stadium, that's roughly what you've got here. The nucleus is very, very small inside here. It itself uh, is made up of uh, nuclei, so I'm not sure which color is which, but there are protons and there are neutrons in there. And um, then we found out bit by bit, piecing things together, that those are made up of and that's where we're at now, probably no. We've come pretty far, but maybe there's more to go. But this is an example of a proton, it's a couple up quarks and a down quark, and a neutron is just an up quark and a down quark, etc. There you go. Now you know everything. Particle physics right? okay. um, We also, so, so to summarize um, that, we now have this sort of period, you guys remember the periodic table? We studied that in high school, we learned the periodic table. This is our periodic table of elementary particles, and we've completely filled this in. It's all filled in, it's amazing. We've seen all of these particles here. What's interesting about it, we only need these guys. If you guys want to make this room, if you want to bake a cake, you need uh, up quarks and down quarks, that gives you protons or neutrons, and you need electrons spinning around your all set. Everything we need. We have no clue why these other guys exist. They're exactly the same. The up quark, the, the charm quark, the top quark, it, it, these guys are exactly the same, but they're much more massive. This guy's extraordinarily massive. We don't get that. They get heavier as they go that way. This is what we've seen, though. This is what we measure. We measure higher energies. They produce things of higher mass, and that's what we see. Okay, It's not that we wanted it. We didn't have to have it, but we have it. They're there. And these muons here, for example, are the things which are coming down and bopping over the head and hitting uh, the cosmic piano all the time. They make it only because they're relativistic. So they're coming down super duper fast, so they live longer than in our lifetime than they do in their lifetime. Okay? And they make it down here, and then there's a tau quark, and a tau lepton as well. These guys here are the force carrying particles. The gluon, great name, is what holds together protons and neutrons. It's also, uh, that force also holds the protons and the neutrons together in the nuclei. The residual force is still very, very strong. Uh, and you have photons, that's light, a lot of photons coming out of here. And uh, these guys are the weak nuclear force, uh, and so these guys help to, to give us nuclear uh, uh, radiation, like so, or, or give us, uh, for example, nuclear fission. So uh, this is what we have, this is it. This is what we figured out, somewhat. I know you're wondering where's gravity, but it's not there. We didn't figure that out yet. Um, this here is how those guys are allowed to interact. Okay, here's your quantum field theory. Uh, we have, uh, we were able to condense everything onto a couple. It basically shows symmetries behind this. 
And uh, what's terrible in our literature, Emily Neuter, who's, who's just a brilliant mathematician, was the one who figured out the different symmetries are there. There's a symmetry, there's a conservation. Another woman who did incredible physics but nobody knows about. Um, and it's thanks to her that Einstein and others were able to do things they did. But anyway, they put together this. So while we're out there measuring stuff, we tell the theorists what we've seen, and they're able to come up with this and say, okay, because of this, these interactions are what exist, and, uh, and then they make predictions. And this cup gave us many predictions. Some of those particles I showed you, we knew exactly where to find them. The last one, the top quark, the most massive one, we knew what its mass was for. We knew what its charge was. We knew everything about it before we actually found it, thanks to this work. So that's what we've got. We've learned everything about particle physics. Um, but we had a problem with that. I told you guys that some particles are more massive or heavier than other particles. And you were thinking, but Steve, these are elementary particles. They have no structure to them. How do they have mass? And that's what this guy was thinking about in 1964. It was a problem we had. We just found out there was a force that means they have force carrying particles, and they were probably massive, and it didn't make sense to us. And this guy worked it out. And uh, you see him drawing the equations that we use now. Uh, basically, what he described, this is Peter Higgs, other two uh, people who, who uh, were credited with this, Francois Anglaire, Robert Root, and there were others that were involved in this as well. Um, uh, they predicted that what happened just after the Big Bang was that a field condensed. Now, that's a strange thing to understand. But if you take a magnet, for example, and you heat it up, the magnetic field around it actually disappears if it's hot enough. And then if you let it cool down, the field will condense, it will appear. And that's apparently what happened with this. This appeared shortly after the Big Bang. This field, a particle interacts with that field, and the strength that it interacts with that field is its mass. Okay? I can't tell you how to understand that any better. You don't look at those dimensions. It's, it's something mind-boggling, but it's what drives people to do particle things. It's really cool. It also drives us to drink these things a little bit. Um, but uh, it, it, this was it. It's basically the last two lines of the, of the uh, that I wrote down for you that were on the coffee cup, or we have t-shirts as well, um, include this, the existence of this field and how it gives mass to particles. And, um, and, and so we actually cheated. We had those on the coffee cups long before we actually discovered any evidence that said they were right. Okay? But it worked. It gave us a lot of predictions. So we were very confident uh, that we would be able to find it if we could go to high enough energy. So we said, let's do one more upgrade with a high enough energy that we can actually solve whether or not that field exists. And so we built this. You guys have seen this before, right? This is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It's a European uh, laboratory for particle physics. We're uh, in Geneva, I would say, you know, Switzerland, but actually most of this is, oops, sorry, is in France. Uh, there's a, the border goes, it's a kind of a weird border. It goes around here. Actually, we, France has a little bit of the airport too, so you can fly in and go out. Um, but this is, this is CERN, the, the laboratory. And this is all, fortunately, you don't see that when you fly over. Uh, you see the Jura Mountains, you'll see the lake, you'll see the, the, the Alps, which are over there on the picture. It's all very, very beautiful. And this is all buried about 100 meters underground. And it's 27 kilometers around. And because that was such an easy thing to do, we put the whole thing at a slight angle. Because the ground's at a slight angle to keep everything 100 meters underground, uh, we had to do that. And even the experiments have to be at the right angle for everything to work. But hey, no problem. Um, great engineers, great designers. Um, so we built this and we put four different places, these four different places here are where we cross the beams. Okay, that's where, and, and, and we like to say there's collisions there, but it's kind of one of the interactions that happen there. We bring the beams and have them pass through each other. Now the beams, this is what's kind of cool, they're actually in bunches. And each bunch, tiny bunch, is 100 billion photons. It's like galaxies, bringing galaxies together. 100 billion 
protons hit 100 billion protons, we have to do a lot of work squeezing them into a fine beam so that uh, they will actually interact. They will run into each other. And it's not just that, that there's 100 billion protons. The protons, they have quarks in them, which are very small too. And so the, the probability of actually getting those quarks and, and gluons to interact with each other is very, very small. So we put gazillions in there. That's the right term. Um, lots and lots of protons. And, um, and we do this. So the, the, the beams cross uh, every, every 25 nanoseconds, which is a very short time. And, uh, and then we have, we get roughly when 100 billion or go over, it gets 100 billion, we get about 60 on average that actually uh, uh, pass through each other with protons. So that's what happens here at each of these places. There's four beautiful experiments, and I'll show them to you. Um, they're all fantastic. Of course, um, uh, Arturo and David prefer this one. It's the Atlas experiment. I prefer this one. I work on Atlas. But they're all spectacular. Atlas and CMS are actually two general purpose uh, detectors. They're designed, they're like the most powerful lens on your microscope to look for anything and everything. Um, and the Higgs boson was high on our list at the beginning. Uh, but these guys are also very interesting. LHCD tries to look at the imbalance of matter and antimatter in the universe. And Alice likes to look at the really early universe when there was quarks and gluons uh, in a kind of primordial soup before they formed into protons and neutrons. So um, we'll see some images from them if that happens. Um, but that's, they were designed for this. And, and um, it's amazing because these are, what's, you know, yeah, they're big. Uh, what's important about them is they're huge international collaborations. So on uh, in our collaboration, I can say we have about five to six thousand people who contribute to it, and three thousand authors. Three thousand of my best friends uh, <laughs> were authors uh, on that. So like I showed you Peter Higgs, his paper that the proposed uh, the Higgs boson was one A4 sheet of paper. Okay. It got rejected because they said he needs some more, and so he, he made some stuff on the other side. And because of what he wrote on the other side, he gets credited for the Higgs boson. Uh, because the, the theorist said it was silly to write down those boson. If there's a field, there's a particle. But anyway, uh, he gets the credit for it. And, um, and the credit should just go to the, to the referee. Um, uh, but we have, if you look at our papers, and we have over a thousand papers each for the experiments. That's a lot. Every paper is an expansion of our understanding of the universe. Uh, you'll find 15 pages or so dedicated to our names. Really fine, right? So there's a lot of people. We thought it was a lot of people. Um, what I want to do now is something which I think is fantastic. Uh, a composer named Roger Zarin. I wish he could have been here with her tonight. He couldn't, but he uh, is a wonderful, very nice person. Uh, he uh, is actually now doing a kind of internship where he goes into Fermi Lab, which is in Chicago in the US. And uh, he, um, he wrote this piece on his own, without talking to us at all, which describes uh, the LAC, the whole, where we went from uh, the, the, the continuum to accelerating to getting up to the point where we had collisions and finally our discovery. He was just a, very much interested uh, and excited by the discovery of the Higgs boson. So he wrote this piece. And of course, you guys all know that in Sofia, there's an incredible group of musicians called the Silhouettes. Uh, they're in chamber. Uh, there's, there's Roger, by the way. Um, sorry you couldn't be here. He would love to be here. Uh, but um, these guys are not only extraordinarily beautiful, but they're fantastic musicians. And they live here in Sofia. And if you haven't seen them, get on their list and go see them perform. You're going to see a little sampling here of what they can do, but they, they really are uh, truly tremendous. Um, we have with us uh, Kalina Gabi Lilia. Uh, Chris, uh, the, the far right, now when I saw them five years ago, um, it was great, I could see them all together, all doing, it was just nice to meet them and all, and they performed for us. Um, but in between that time, uh, you can notice the, the last names here, Gabi and Chris got busy. And now there's um, a couple children uh, at home. And as we all know, a man's place is at home, taking care of the kids. So Chris is not going to be with us. Is that right, Gabi? No, no, okay. So, but we do have the pleasure of having Kalina, Gabi, and Lilia here uh, with us uh, to perform 
Roger's Ayers piece, The Elements.
you. Thank you so much to the Silhouette Chamber Ensemble. You're going to be back, though. Don't go too far. Okay, we have a lot of work to do here. Um, before we get going, we're going to do one last thing, which is completely an experiment. I'm an experimentalist. We've got to try something. We're going to try something great. Uh, I'm told that chaos is a part of physics. Some people tell me that. I, I believe them, especially when you're writing a thesis. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to show you this first before we get going. Um, this is where we're at today. So I showed you before, there's a couple images. And by the way, don't believe the physicists when they show you an image and say, that's a Higgs boson. Okay? If I show you this and say, that's a Higgs boson, you say, okay, he must know what he's talking about. These are candidates. We never know, like I mentioned, we never know what happens in here exactly. And so all we do is statistically figure things out. And, uh, and this is the statistics. So when we were looking for the Higgs boson, we could simulate what the world was like without the Higgs boson. And that's this, the red here. Those are different known processes uh, that we can see different types of times when you'll see in this case, four leptons, four electrons, four muons, or two electrons and two muons. And uh, we saw this excess grow and grow and grow, and that told us that we'd found something. That's how you find it. It's not one picture by one picture, uh, but that's how it shows up. We've measured this now very precisely. We know a lot about it. We're going to measure the heck out of it for many years to come, because this is a stepping stone. Anything, remember this, anything that has mass, any elementary particle that has mass, interacts with this guy. And so that means that there's stuff out there we still haven't figured out, interacts uh, there. And so we'll, by measuring the properties of this. And just because you're sure, really, Steve, is it true that the Higgs boson gives mass to particles? Well. This is a measure here of how much the particles have been interacting with the Higgs. We can measure that by seeing how many times they get produced when we produce the Higgs boson. Um, and this is the mass of the particle. And it's exactly as predicted. Exactly here along this line, uh, we see where the different particles line up. And this is according to their mass. Mm -hmm. And this is wonderful that humanity could do that. Duh. 1964, that was predicted. In 2012, it was found, and this is where we're at today. It also sucks for experimentalists because we want to prove theorists wrong. We're going to keep trying to do that um, because when we find out that they're wrong, that gives us a clue of what's in the future. And there's a lot of big questions that remain. So I'll show you some of those questions. I hope you'll still be able to sleep tonight. Um, so some of those questions are here. Um, same ones. The Zog questions. Uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? Well, it seems you can see it all right here, right? Uh, but this is weird, and we don't get this at all. This is sort of the expansion of our universe in time. But it looks here like our universe is expanding faster and faster, and that you would not expect. Now, I understand why I did that during COVID, um, but the universe is not in COVID all of this time. It's expanding, and that means that gravity is not pulling everything back together. That's a really weird thing. So there's something out there. There's some huge amount of energy. I'll show you how much later that is making this expansion happen. We, we measure this by measuring um, clusters of galaxies, supernova mainly, uh, and seeing how their light is moving away from us, and it's going faster and faster. So we're... We're, we're completely confused about this. If you have an answer to that, let me know afterwards. Um, we'll give you a drink and a Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> this is a big question we've had since the beginning of time. Why are we here? <laughs> we know why we're here. It's a bar. But why are we here in the <laughs> greater scheme of things? Um, big Bang happened. Whenever we see these interactions, we know there's equal amounts of matter and antimatter that get produced. It started from just energy. So when you start with just energy, you're going to produce equal amounts of matter and antimatter. That's what happened. And the matter ran into the antimatter. And when matter hits antimatter, it annihilates and gives you energy. Okay, So that's what happened. All of the stuff that was produced at the Big Bang disappeared. But a little bit of dust remained. And that's us. And we don't get that. We really don't get that. 
There aren't anti-galaxies out there. We have not found any, uh, and, and we're confused by this. There seems to be something different. There's a, a, a lack of perfect symmetry between the two. Um, we don't get it. Any of the, any, if you, any of you have answers to any of these questions, let me, let me know. Um, well, we are looking into that. Um, this question sticks around uh, because many times we were certain that we knew the answer. Atoms were it. Democritus said, hey, atoms are it. That's the smallest thing you can get to. Um, well, it was a good guess. It wasn't too bad, but atoms are here. And now we've gone into atoms. We found nuclei, and we found the nuclei have protons and neutrons, and we've gone into quarks, and it's very natural to ask, you know, does this, you know, Mariushka have an even smaller doll? And so can we open it up and, and find it out? Uh, but we do, we do look for that, and we do look for that with the LHC, and when we build more energetic accelerators, we'll look for it then. You would look for excited states of these guys, and we haven't seen that yet. An excited state means that there's something inside. There's a structure to it. And so uh, we're continually looking for that, and it's natural to look for that. It's called compositeness, but we have not seen it, and it behaves exactly as expected if they were elementary particles, particles with nothing inside. We will see. Big question. Um, and what's up with gravity? We don't get gravity at all. You guys noticed that, right? It's not on the coffee cup. We don't get gravity at a microscopic level. Uh, it's perplexing. But one of the reasons why it's so perplexing is its strength is very, very small compared to the other forces. I know, like this morning when you had to get out of bed, it was very strong, right? But relatively speaking, at the level of quarks and gluons, at that energy, um, it's extraordinarily weak. Uh, you can see here uh, that the strongest interaction is the nuclear interaction. That's what, again, I mentioned it holds together protons and neutrons, and it even pulls them together. And, and by being able to bring protons uh, and, and neutrons together, you can make nuclear fusion. That's the energy that gets released because this is much stronger uh, than that, and we really would like to get fusion, uh, hasn't happened, I mean, we're getting there. We're getting, there's a lot of good research going on there. Um, electromagnetism is what's making those protons push away from each other, right, because they have the same charge. Relatively speaking, they're pretty close to each other in strength at the energies we're looking at. The nuclear interaction is what gives us the heat from the sun, it's a nuclear fission, and um, it's weaker than electromagnetism. In fact, it's kind of these, these forces we found are, through symmetries are, are, are close to each other. Again, Neuter's theorem. She showed us there's a symmetry, there's a symmetry here. And so weak nuclear um, interactions are similar, but they're a bit weaker than electromagnetism. But gravity, look at it here. 10 to the minus 41 is a big number. I mean, a very big, small number. How do I say that? It's really small. If you wanted to put it in real terms, it's it's a million, 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 million times weaker than electromagnetism. And you guys see this every day. There's magnets stuck to refrigerators, right? It's just a refrigerator. It's just a little magnet. There's an entire planet pulling on that magnet, and it's losing, right? It's losing. So it's a huge, huge difference. And as such, it's really hard for us to probe and get to those energies that will allow us to understand gravity more, but we keep trying. There are different ideas that have come forward. Um, some great uh, theorists have come up with an idea like this. Uh, I know a couple of them, Lisa Randall, Ramon Sundrum. Lisa Randall's books are great, by the way. Read her books. Um, uh, they propose that there's maybe extra dimensions. So we're electromagnetic. That's just the way we are. We're mainly held together with the electromagnetism. But it could be that we just live on a sort of three-dimensional manifold, kind of like an ant on a wire. We just are unaware of these other dimensions. But there are other dimensions. And, um, and maybe uh, gravity lives in those dimensions. And we just see a little bit of it. That's one idea. Now, they propose something. This, this could mean that at high energy densities, we would have a glimpse of the other dimensions, and that would make these things called micro black holes. Maybe you heard of that? Those were fantastic, because when the world heard the word black hole, and the LHC was going to come on, and maybe see black hole, then everybody was, knew that we were going to destroy the planet, and that gave everyone's attention. 
I can tell you, it was a huge difference. When I went to work on LEP, which is a previous accelerator, nobody knew when we turned on. Nobody cared. It was, it was not on anything. Uh, I had to call my parents and tell them, hey, we're turning on. It's like, you know, are you eating all right? You know? um, but the LHC, when it came on, everyone was there to watch and to see what it was like when the world got destroyed. It didn't get destroyed. Uh, if we had made one of those black holes, it would have just disappeared right away. We can't make any more energy than we put in, and a a, a particle fission collision, a, a collision of protons in the LHC is like this. That's the amount of energy. We really can't destroy the planet. Okay, don't tell anyone because we get funding by um, making <laughs> a movie. Um, that's what happens there. Um, so, uh, so that didn't seem to pan out. It was a great idea. So far, we haven't seen it. It might be that it'll happen, but we but we haven't gotten there. Um, and then there's this, and this is something, uh, my personal opinion is that I think we're on the edge of discovering this, but I don't know, and you know, I can't make predictions like this, but it seems to me we're going to get close. Um, and that's just this big question that happened about the spinning of galaxies and what holds them together. Another uh, brilliant woman, I always mention these brilliant women because they, they weren't given the, the uh, the recognition that they deserve. This is Vera Rubin, if you can see her name. Uh, uh, she was a brilliant uh, particle physicist and astronomer and could have had a couple Nobel Prizes out of this, but they neglected to give that to her. She uh, knew about the work of a guy named Fritz Zwicky, who had looked at the speed of clusters of galaxies and said there's something wrong with the speed, the, the rate at which they're moving is too fast. It means that there's more gravity out there, there's more mass than what we see. So he came up with this terrible phrase called black or dark matter. There's dark matter out there. Uh, what he meant was invisible matter, stuff out there we can't see. And so Vera got this idea later on. She said, oh, well, that's interesting. We should be able to measure that. And uh, she looked at the, she got a device that allowed her to measure the speed of stars in the galaxy. What you expect, I know what you guys are expecting, you say, oh, okay, well, you can figure this out from Newtonian physics, you know, Pluto and Neptune go really slowly around the sun, and, and Mercury is spinning around, relatively speaking. And so you can calculate that. The, the stars on the inside must go much faster than the stars on the outside. So that's what she figured she would see. She did the measurements, and she found out that Mother Nature did not agree with that. Mother Nature said, has these stars going nearly as fast as the stars on the inside? And so then she made the leap. The, this is what tells you when the scientist is brilliant, I made that little leap that said, if that's happening, and if it's due to dark matter or invisible matter, then uh, that means that this has got a lot in it, and she calculated how much. And it wasn't like a little bit. It's 80 to 90% of this galaxy is dark matter. So it's hard to believe we won't be able to figure out what that is. So far, we haven't. It affects things through gravity. But again, gravity is really weak, so it makes it really difficult for us in particle physics to find it. But if it affects things with gravity, it's stuff that has mass. And as you guys know, if it's an elementary particle and has mass, it will interact with the Higgs boson. So my opinion is we're close, okay? We're big, being able to figure this out. Um, but when you put all of this together, all of these questions together, all the measurements we've made, we discover exactly what all of you knew all along. Right? And that's this. Uh, the universe is a beer. Uh, and here it is. Uh, this is this is our universe. It, it's a dark beer um, because it's mostly dark energy, dark matter. There's some stuff that we see. So the stuff you're familiar with is half a percent of our universe. And that's stars and planets and all that stuff and the stand and that piano. They're all made, they're all up in here. Okay? All the pianos in the world still half a percent. Um, interstellar gas that you, that's between the stars, by definition, out there, the stuff that forms into planets, forms into stars, or, or it came from stars that exploded, that makes up the rest of sort of the 5% of matter that we know about. Then this dark matter, Vera Rubin calculated, is roughly a quarter of our universe. 27% of our universe is that. But then if you take all that stuff together and you look at how much the universe is expanding faster and faster, it's the acceleration of the expansion, not just the expansion, that would require some sort of energy we know nothing about that's about two-thirds of our universe, 
of our universe would be that. And we're clueless on that. We have absolutely no idea. Maybe we're getting more and more hints from astronomy where they make more and more precise measurements, uh, but we really don't know the process that's making that happen. Um, and again, let me know what you think it is, and we'll, we'll, you know, that, that will really be push us forward. Um, maybe even two beers I get you for that. Um, so that's what we know. Um, now, there's a lot of unknowns. So what do we do when we have questions about the universe? Um, well, as scientists, well, if we have questions, we try to find the answers with all means available. Okay? So we're going to do that now, tonight, and I have no idea what's going to happen. But we're going to try all means available. Now, before we get started, I'm going to bring everybody up on stage. I want to thank all of you for coming here and following science. Thank Ratio for organizing all of this. Um, also, Boyka here, who's a, a, a theorist from Sophia, started this whole idea way back, well, five years ago, I guess it was, and, and introduced me to these wonderful musicians. And then even more important to that, there's Plamen, who I met working at the Petel, uh, who I spent a lot of time with drinking and talking about these ideas. So, um, so no good bartenders are very, very important. Okay, so now let's get started here. Um, so we're going to answer it by all means necessary. That means I would like all of the musicians and all of the cyborgs, I think we only have one tonight, but all the cyborgs, <laughs> to, to come up here on stage, and I want, the, I want Mother Nature as well. Uh, to get involved, so we need the cosmic piano involved in this as well, and we are going to um, create chaos, or we're going to figure out the universe, one or the other, okay? So everybody up here for a cosmic symphony. Everybody up.